Senator Ludlam. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, isn't it nice to be back? I rise to respond to the Governor General's speech, and I want to open with some observations about the ritual that we are presently engaged in. Um, and I want to draw on um, the former clerk of this place, Harry Evans, when he made some observations in 2004 um, at a conference of presiding officers about the address in reply uh, and the degree to which um, the ritual that we're presently engaged in of, of making an observation uh, in reply to Her Excellency's speech yesterday um, is or isn't in accord, um, in fact, with our own constitution. Uh, the Governor-General, um, as Mr Evans observes in his essay of 2004, um, and I'll, I'll quote, the Governor-General's opening speech which sets out the government's program involves the Governor-General, who is otherwise supposed to be a politically neutral head of state, in speaking as if he or she were the actual head of government and in making contentious and partisan political statements. Now, I certainly in no way uh, want my remarks to be construed as criticism of the Governor-General. Um, in the Boyer lectures, we had the pleasure and the benefit of her of her considered views, and I think yesterday we would all agree that uh, Her Excellency acquitted her responsibilities with dignity and managed to make her way through the entire speech um, with a straight face. There were only two moments where the, the decorum that is expected of this chamber broke down during the speech. Um, as I recall, the first uh, the proposal that the new government's foreign policy priorities are Geneva, uh, Jakarta, not Geneva, and I think you could forgive this side of the chamber a moment um, of, of dark humour as we reflect on the diplomatic omni-shambles that has unfolded uh, as the government has blundered from one disastrous engagement uh, with our counterparts in Jakarta to the next. And on the other occasion, uh, where Ms Bryce is, is forced to commend the new government's priorities for fast broadband for all Australians while presiding over the deliberate destruction of an entity that was poised to provide just that. Those observations aside, we listened uh, carefully, uh, as we do to all, all addresses, because they do set out the agenda of the forthcoming government. I congratulate my colleagues on the other side of the chamber uh, for the new responsibilities which they've assumed. Senator Johnson, who's joined us, uh, taking on one of the gravest of all responsibilities, uh, the oversight of the Australian Defence Force while we are still deployed in a theatre of war. Uh, it is an enormous responsibility that settles on all of us uh, as we contemplate um, the challenges that are before us. As, I suppose, a Republican, I just want to uh, close these observations with the sense that, in fact, I do look forward to the day where we don't persist with the ritual of uh, Her Majesty the Queen's representative in this place summoning Parliament, summoning the members of the House of Representatives into this chamber to advise the Crown, uh, and would put that, in fact, uh, as one of the world's oldest democracies, we probably have outgrown this ritual that we are presently providing a reply to. Now, the Daily Telegraph states, so we know that it must be true. Um, we also know that it's one of our Prime Minister's favourite news sources, but this is not an actual quote. So if uh, members of the government um, want to contradict, then I'm, I'm happy to, to correct the record. The Daily Telegraph is, is reporting our new Prime Minister, Mr Abbott, is saying that opposition is 90 per cent theatre and 10 per cent hard policy grind, and government is the reverse. If our Prime Minister has been correctly quoted in that regard, I think in many ways uh, that is actually quite instructive. It's quite an illuminating observation that, obs that uh, opposition being 90 per cent theatre and 10 per cent hard policy grind, for me, explains the policy vacuum that was described to the chamber yesterday on behalf of the new government. And it also describes and, and for me, very well illuminates the degree of dissembling, the degree of deception that the, that the now Prime Minister from opposition 
and his, and his front bench, his shadow front bench of the time, engaged in an order to win government using this precept that it doesn't really matter what you say. It's 90 per cent theatre. The carbon tax will wipe Wyala off the map. The mining tax will catastrophically damage an important export industry. Um, that border protection that we will protect Western Sydney from people fleeing war and genocide in other parts of the region because they're making you unsafe and making Parramatta Road busy. That this 90 per cent theatre idea, when it's transformed, when you actually win government through that um, Murdoch enabled process of mass deception over a period of years, that you wind up holding the Treasury benches and the front benches in this place without much of an idea of what it is that you want to do. The 10 per cent policy grind that then has to unfold into a program for actually governing a nation in a deeply uncertain time, what we then see on display and has been commented on in the press and already in this place is effectively government by stealth, uh, an agenda that unfolds behind closed doors under cover of military operations and um, and bland euphemisms, and the theatre starts to fall away. What I did last time uh, we were given an address in reply by the Governor-General, and as I say, it's no slight on her, um, is to observe what's not in the speech, what wasn't in there, what's occurring in the background that wasn't forwarded for our contemplation and consideration today. And that, I suppose, is the great flaw in the ritual, and that's not something that I particularly hold the Liberal Party to, because uh, when they were in government, the Labor Party did the same thing. You foreground the things that you're proud of and that you want the country to talk about, and you background or you hide or you bury the things that are going on that you're not so proud about. The most critical thing for me that didn't exist in the speech, so therefore presumably doesn't exist on the government's agenda is the fact that this is the age of dangerous climate change, that global warming is not some mid or late 21st century phenomenon that our grandkids had better get geared up for, but that it's real and that it is flattening cities and that it is aggravating and enhancing the severity of bushfires and causing more violent weather around the world now. And that policy blind spot if you could call it that, uh, on this government's agenda, for me is probably the most dangerous thing about the present uh, government and its policy stance. There's no mention of resource depletion. There is no mention whatsoever of the fragile global economic climate, where it appears that the lessons of the global financial crisis in 2008 have been swept in into an untidy pile under the carpet uh, and that we are proposing to simply continue to make the same mistakes. The budget emergency, if, if anything fits the template of political theatre in order to win government at any costs, the budget emergency, oh, well, I haven't seen it. Any, anybody who wants to jump up and make a contribution from the government side as to where their missing budget emergency has gone would set a lot of minds at rest. Nothing at all about homelessness or the housing affordability crisis, the 100,000 uh, Australians who are homeless and the roughly 10,000 of that number who are sleeping rough, who have absolutely nowhere to go, uh, were completely missing from the speech. The broader housing affordability crisis as it impacts on nearly everybody, particularly the entire generation of Australians who have been priced probably out of ever owning their own home and who will rent for life was also airbrushed out of the speech. Paralysing traffic congestion in nearly of all, all of Australia's major cities didn't make its way onto the agenda, but uh, as we compared our notes after the Governor-General's address yesterday, noted that everybody is getting a brand new freeway, that there'll be bulldozers down the end of everybody's streets, but no attempt to engage with the traffic congestion, the, the vast traffic jams that now paralyse our great cities because of decades of underinvestment and abandonment of the city's agenda by this former government uh, when you had government for, for 13 years during the Howard era, 
that we saw in recent years the beginnings of an attempt to turn that around. And now we are back to the age of the bulldozer and the freeway. Nothing spoken of, so presumably nothing that the government wants to draw attention to about its ongoing proposals to dump radioactive waste in the Northern Territory, which with great dishonour were pursued by the Labor Party when they were in government, but which we must remember were initiated by the Howard government. Nothing at all about the prospects of the uranium sector that we uh, discovered yesterday that the honeymoon is over in South Australia, yet another uranium operation has hit the wall. Nothing there at all about the fortunes of that most toxic of mining sectors. Nothing whatsoever about the unfolding surveillance scandal enveloping uh, countries around the world that our great and powerful ally, the United States, uh, embroiled in surveillance overreach of the highest order that has led to um, remarkable soul searching in the United States, including from those who drafted the Patriot Act, inquiries in the UK, inquiries and huge diplomatic uh, uproar in Europe, proposals originating in Brazil for an entirely new governance structure for the internet. Um, nothing at all from uh, the Governor General on behalf of the new Prime Minister about these issues which affect us all. What we hear instead is the agenda that the Australian government is open for business. And this manifests very strongly in the way that Prime Minister Abbott frames the debate around Australia being open for business as though we can just run this ancient continent as though it was a giant corporation that the election of the coal billionaire from Queensland, Mr Clive Palmer, to the other place, who seems to believe that commercial experience is the only prerequisite you require for running something as complex as uh, the continent and the Commonwealth of Australia, or Mr Morris Newman, who perhaps gives us the, the essence, if you like, the, the free base economic theory that says uh, markets will run everything markets in unrestrained form will run everything to the, to the benefit of all that the minimum wage is about twice as high as it needs to be. And if only we simply let big business have its way, all would be well. This is a government backing into the 21st century with its eyes fixed on a past that no longer exists. And these are dangerous times to be governed by an executive with its back turned to the century and to the circumstances in which we find ourselves. It is a government of stealth that proposes to be run by corporations for corporations. It is going to take all of the resources that this parliament can bring to bear to hold you to account. Uh, and so that is something um, that we in the Australian Greens and on the crossbenches, that is a responsibility that we take enormously seriously. That when you come to government proclaiming a new age and a new era of transparency, that this chamber will be testing those claims. It will test them this week. The budget estimates committees will test those claims of a new transparency and openness next week in budget estimates. And as this parliament unfolds, make absolutely no mistake that a government with its back turned to the challenges that confront us uh, is going to end in tears as we do, as we have with this government, uh, with the past government, with the one that came before. The Australian Greens are open to negotiation. We are open to collaboration. We are open to working with the crossbenchers or with members from all sides and all parties on the deep challenges that confront us. But the first thing that the Abbott government will need to do is turn around and actually open its eyes to the challenges that are bearing down upon us. Thank you.